Welcome uh, to uh, this lunchtime lecture. So as you know, we have a very intensive uh, lecture, lecture program this quarter, and we try to look at these issues of design, art, and media from a number of different perspectives and also in international perspectives. And uh, I'm really pleased that we have uh, uh, Lucy Bullivan here with, um, as, as our guest today. So Lucy actually has uh, flown all the way from uh, London. And um, I actually, uh, yeah, I met Lucy in a, in a conference in, um, in Manchester some months ago. But, but I have been, um, and that was the first time I met, met her, but, but I've been very aware of the work that she's been doing uh, on the field before, through, mostly through her publications. Uh, and um, and I, let me be just um, to give you an idea, so I will just show you uh, these uh, three books that, that she's made, this, um, the one on the top, it's uh, called Responsive Environments, Architecture, Art, and Design. Then uh, we have something called 4D Social, Interactive Design, Environments. And uh, third one is called 4D Space, Interactive Architecture. And I think that uh, these titles give you a sort of like, a, a sort of like setting kind of a notion, an idea about the field on which Lucy is working as, a, as an uh, actually independent uh, uh, critic, curator, and writer based in, based in London. So, so it is in the intersection between these things, I think, that where we can say that your work is, is really situated. So architectural uh, ideas about architecture, ideas about, ideas about media, ideas about art. And, and I think that it is really interesting because that is pretty much the kind of thing that we are also interested in here at the... At the Design Media Arts. So, uh, so we're very happy to uh, have Lucy here, and uh, and then I think I will just uh, give the floor to her. So let me help me welcome Lucy Bolivar. Thank you very much. Yeah, a pleasure to be here again. I think third time in LA, first time was 20, 20 years ago, which is a slightly sobering experience to realize how long ago that was, since I was fully grown up at the time. <laughs> anyway, okay, doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Okay, now, much because they're of their mutable and liquid qualities, um, custom-designed interactive projects, which is basically the focus of my lecture today in urban contexts, can possess a powerful resonance. As presentation territories for artists, architects, designers, and curators, um, urban edifices, their skins, foyers, um, and interiors, um, can be transformed into immersive communicational spaces um, ones with their own uh, individual DNA. But so too can public spaces of circulation uh, by foot and by car, um, each uh, project intervening in its own unique way in the cultural practices and norms of the city in which the, the work is situated. So, position between structure and environment, facade and installation, building and program, hard and soft, their hybrid nature shifts architects, architecture's focus from tectonics into a new relationship, um, an interdependent relationship with installation and media art. Moreover, creating installations that perform in ways which are not permanent um, but of limited life, manipulable, programmable, and even tunable, and in some cases um, uh, require the involvement of the observing public to complete their meaning, is, is something which is actually very fundamental to the, to the process. They're not soft. Um, 
uh, sorry, they are soft, as I uh, refer to the title of my lecture, and they're not, at the same time, not wholly predetermined. Therefore, they enter into a dynamic relationship with space and technology, giving the environmental and social infrastructure role that media has had for some time uh, now, new possibilities that are digitally derived, but at the same time, distinctly spatial and physical in their nature. So on the screen, one of the most powerful examples of this is actually by now a relative antique in terms of interactive art, um, which is, as you probably all know, is Tower of Winds by uh, Toyo Ito, created in um, 1986. Um, 22 years old, I can hardly believe it. Um, a new interactive shell for an old concrete tower in Yokohama in Japan. Its kaleidoscope of color and light is the result of the structure's ability to monitor and filter the air, sounds, and noises of the city. Um, it represents the city's visual complexity as a never-ceasing, ever-changing wind, and it fulfills uh, Ito's desire, expressed at the time, to create architecture that is like an unstable flowing body. So um, I'm going to continue now with a few more uh, general cultural observations. But meanwhile, continuing the theme of uh, wind, I'm going to fast forward to uh, last summer um, and uh, show you a quick video clip while I carry on talking um, of a work called Wind to Light. Which was, um, which was done for London's Architecture Week last summer, and it was staged on the South Bank. Um, it's an experimental uh, site-specific installation that shows alternative um, and sustainable ways of harnessing energy through exploring the power of wind in the city, and actually, in fact, visualizing it as an ephemeral cloud of light. It's custom built using scaled down wind turbines to generate power, which um, illuminated, um, since it's no longer there, it was literally only up for one week, which illuminated hundreds of mounted LEDs, which create um, beautiful fire, firefly-like fields of light. Uh, so wind is visually interpreted as electronic patterns across the installation. So the capacity of responsive designs of this kind to hybridize space is highly significant in the context of the varied effects of globalization on cities, which affects, um, amongst other things, um, generic standardization of systems and aesthetics, as well as a high degree, in some cases, of social dislocation. And it's important, too, um, responsive design practices as, a, as ways of embodying the sense of difference that the city as a place of competing interests, politics, and languages epitomizes. And at a as a practice, it's evolving at a time when it, pervasive or ubiquitous computing is increasingly embedding everyday surfaces in which technology operates as an invisible tool almost as an extension of your skin or your body. Some projects use surveillance technologies critically, exploring the tension between culture and commerce um, and public and private spheres of life, which have adopted their own often quite arcane patterns of synthesis. Others result from hacking commercial technology products, expensive and uh, cheap, um, whichever they might be, uh, to customize them for personalized results. Public space as a concept is becoming increasingly contested, and that has led to its hybridity with proliferating mixed programs and um, an increasingly time-based use of space. I mean, one example of this, of course, being that some leading museums, and in the UK I would cite the Science Museum, Tate Modern, um, Victorian Albert Museum and National Gallery, who were early adopters of digital space or digital technologies, 
and have developed virtual layers to their galleries um, as part of uh, what I could call hybrid programs of edutainment, um, education and entertainment as a sort of mi um, mix, taking on the identity at times of playgrounds or even nightclubs. Architects are attracted to interactive projects and have been lured away from the, the um, uh, overwhelmingly tectonic nature of the profession, in part due to their relatively quick to attain effects. While media artists um, turning their hands to environmental projects have long since regarded the urban uh, landscape, spaces used daily by large numbers of people, whether it be skins of buildings, um, foyers, interiors, circulation spaces, as man manipulable or places where technology could be used as a creative tool to raise the haptic and the intuitive thresholds of environments, um, fostering emotional engagement in spatial, in, in, in digitally driven spatial experiences. So um, that's my little preamble. I'm going to show you uh, oh no, it's a bit more preamble, but I'm going to show you a selection now of completed projects, uh, mostly from the last five years, but, but going through history just a, a, a little bit, um, that fulfill these various roles in, di in different ways. But first, just a little bit more cultural history. And of course, uh, this, this uh, interactive um, hybrid field has a very short condensed history, mainly dating from the late 80s, early 90s. When it comes to individual buildings and their programmability, we can refer back to Buckminster Fuller, um, his shading devices like the environmental valves at the United States Pavilion Dome at the 1967 World Expo in Montreal. It was one of the first programmable surfaces used in connection with a building. And then in Paris in the 1950s, Nicolas Schoeffer, uh, the, the artist, worked with an architect, worked with sound artists, and tried to create many utopian experiments along the River Seine in, in Paris uh, for cybernetic towers. Um, I'm actually going to interview his widow, um, Eleonora, who's a lady in her uh, late 80s, I think, in Paris in, in the next few months, and I will um, be excited to find out more about that whole period. Um, the radical English architectural group Archigram and the architect Cedric Price, uh, you probably very well aware, they argued for changeable structures and plug-in cities back in the 1960s. More recently, Jean Nouvel's Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, influenced by Buckminster Fuller's dome, included retra retractable shading devices. So architects have been devising responsive building concepts for quite some time, but relatively few have been built um, or were built until the 1980s. Discussions about interac uh, in interactive or, say, intelligent architecture have tended to focus on environmental controls, sun louvers, centralized ICT systems, or retroreflective surfaces, um, and so on. But now new technologies allow us to have a conversation with our environments. Moreover, we can begin to perceive the designed environment as an operating system, uh, one with users being given unprecedented potential to create personal programs. Now, while the physically permanent identity of architecture has helped to define society for centuries, now some architectural practitioners have disengaged from tectonics as we traditionally understand it and are taking the disciplines into the realm of what um, architect um, Usman Haq, who, who's um, based in London and uh, was born in Washington, D.C., in fact, has called soft space. So I can't claim soft spa space as my own invention, but um, I'm very grateful to Usman for coming up with the uh, idea. A more fluid, ephemeral form of digitally enabled design based on precisely these personalized experiences and responses. Today, customized bespoke software is part of a new generation of technologically enabled spatial systems 
frequently using LED lighting, sensors, Wi-Fi, RFID tags, and respond to external stimuli such as biological data, meteorological data like changes in temperature and levels of humidity, uh, weed, wind um, speed and so on. Uh, electromagnetic fields in some cases, and other programmable data like mobile phone calls. Pioneers in this hybrid uh, field can be architects, as I said, who've chosen to turn away from or to enhance, enhance architecture in a meta-architectural uh, way as a purely tectonic matter. Media artists, interactive designers who may favor wearable computing projects and software engineers. So in a relatively short period of time, the discipline's language of mutability, allied with a live supernatural quality, has through a bottom-up process of creating and testing prototypes, evolved a spatial practice that is both focused on the digital on the electronic screen and the challenge of going beyond it to create bio-digital narratives. And the projects that I'm going to show in a minute um, somehow, let's say, um, fall into these two categories um, and maybe have some, create some sort of dialogue between the two. Now, one issue to be aware of, of course, is the difference between interactive and responsive. Now, ITO's tower, of course, is empowered through its, uh, its sensory software um, to be responsive to the changing stimuli of the to Tokyo cityscape as a kind of softscape. Um, an ATM machine, by contrast, is purely interactive. Now, um, to illuminate this further, I mean, the British, a good example um, is of by, was by the British cybernetician Gordon Pask, um, who created many very interesting experimental cybernetic works. Um, and he came up with a concept of conversation theory, a generative activity which gives identity to participants and leads to the construction of me meaning rather than what is predetermined um, to what is new. So the construction of meaning through cybernetic process um, is, is, uh, is fulfilled through a conversational frame rather than being purely a matter of, com of communication, exchanging messages containing what is already known. Now this for me is a very important benchmark of evaluating uh, soft space projects because, like city screens, interactive works per se may or may not challenge uh, passive spectatorship. But it's not the only one, and it's not the only way to do this. And the exceptions are extremely interesting in their own right. Now, Ito's Tower of Winds was built the same year, coincidentally, that Jenny Holzer um, created the infamous um, Protect Me From What I Want um, in Times Square in New York city in uh, 1986. It's one of the many outdoor electronic signage projects that embody the idea of the city as a place of competing interests, politics, and languages. Now, it didn't act like a Nike side signboard, um, such as the kind that you will see there now, and ask you to participate in real time with your mobile phone to help design a new trainer, um, but it had political integrity as a statement. Um, soft space is a field that the Dwayans of the New York experimental architecture scene, um, Diller and Scafidio, who are hidden here somewhere. I'm just um, passing through you, uh, the work of um, your your professor, Christian Muller, who I will talk about in a second, just to skip and come back. Here we go. Um, Diller and Scafidio, now of course, Diller, Scafidio and Renfro, have explored um, soft space through many installations, animations, and exhibitions. 
Now, they tease the distinctions between live and mediated experience. They claim that media is, in any case, becoming more environmental, as I already mentioned, replicating the real, as Liz Dillard said to me. And in their work, media certainly takes on the mutable live quality of nature. You can't uh, necessarily play with it, however. Um, however, at the same time, they are exposing and making playful comments about the hidden, uh, elusive, and anonymous values and norms of society. So Travelogs, which is a video-based installation for two rather boring long corridors at JFK's International Terminal, which was made in 2002, is a play on surveillance. And the way it works, they used lenticular screens, lenses in the form of a two-dimensional of two-dimensional sheets that produce an image with depth and motion. Um, the moving viewer saw a series of interconnected images taken from large format transparencies in an animated sequence. And these add up into a narrative with stop frames, zooming, and flashbacks captured from four randomly picked travelers and the contents of their suitcases. In uh, 1995, they, a, a proposal which didn't get realized was Cold War, which was an art installation at the National Car Rental Center, the home of the Florida Ice Cats. Now, if that had been realized, it would have transformed the huge ice playing um, field, ice hockey playing field, into a video projection uh, screen, the largest ever built, showing a battery of sequences of ice melting, game highlights, instant replays that debunked the culture of winning. Uh, Christian, who's uh, out of sequence. Sorry, Christian. I don't think he's here, is he? Oh, dear. Oh, well. Um, it's almost invidious choosing a work by Christian to uh, illustrate some of these vital points about interactive uh, architecture and design, because Christian is such a pioneer that any of them would, have, uh, would, would fulfill that role so eloquently. Um, but because it was much earlier, of course, than any of Diller's skid video works, in the late 80s, that Christian um, trained as an architect in Germany, and he'd been so influenced by the, the pioneering work of the new media body, ZKM, in Karlsruhe, that he borrowed um, the whole concept of um, inst installing what were relatively expensive technologies of media art from ZKM and, and set them up in his own studio, thereby uh, transforming his own identity as an architect of buildings. And he began to create a series of stunning media architecture works, um, kinetic light sculpture uh, at the Saal Gallery, which is a shopping mall in Frankfurt in, in 1992, being the most famous. So one of the first elect electronic uh, media artworks of this size to be applied to the facade of a building, um, it was commissioned by a property developer who subsequently um, went out of business, but not due to the quality of the work. And it just was a tough time, I think, a recession. Um, but it was sustained for, the thing was operating for quite a while. Um, he was looking for a concept for a light installation for the facade of his new shopping mall. And it was designed, what Christian came up with was designed to function from twilight onwards. The, the perforated sheet facade transformed itself um, into mobile blue-yellow clusters of light um, with patterns that change like a chameleon according to the weather. Uh, to light levels and temperature monitored via a weather station on the roof. Now, at zero degrees centigrade, the wall was monochrome blue, but as the temperature rose, yellow clusters uh, formed. And near the top of the building, um, Muller pre um, positioned a LED screen showing oscillating graphic renderings of ambient sounds in the street, and by day operated as a news board.
This is a, the, um, it's actually Freshwater Pavilion. It's actually called H2O Expo Pavilion um, by Lars, Lars Spybrook of Knox in uh, Rotterdam. 1994 to 97, it was a permanent, permanent exhibition building um, in, uh, outside Rotterdam, an artificial island. Um, actually, no, not outside Rotterdam. It was in the north of the Netherlands, so which would be logical as it's a kind of artificial island, to support construction of a flood barrier um, in a, a more um, fragile part of the, um, the, the territory of the Netherlands. Form, formally generated using animation software. It's an example of liquid architecture where visitors um, inside confront water in all its variety, varieties and um, are exposed to projections of the molecular structure of water and of wave patterns. And they, they themselves, they activate the wave patterns by passing light-sensitive cells, touching sensors and operating handles. Now, the Kunsthaus in Graz, um, 2003, is a very good example of um, the achievement of a, a synergy, synergy between architecture and electronic media. 900 square meter electronic skin called uh, BIX, which stands for Big Pixels, designed by the Berlin-based architects Realities United for, um, for the Kunsthaus in Austria. Um, uh, completed, um, in fact, designed by the architects Peter Cook um, of Archigram, uh, who founded, of, co-founded Archigram, and Colin Fournier. Um, it was actually a quite a low-tech method with um, a low-resolution ma resolution matrix. It was intended as an instrument and a platform for artistic presentations um, in its context, uh, very close to the, to the river. Now, the brightness of the lamps between, uh, beneath the surface can be adjusted, allowing images, films, animation, and text to be displayed. And as a result, there's a dynamic communication between the building and the surroundings, between content and the viewer's perceptions. And there's also um, quite protracted dialogue between, the, um, between Realities United and the directors and the curators of the museum about this issue of whether commercial sponsorship should be streamed in to the content, to, to the content of the surface. And they, for a long time, managed to uh, avoid and still have, fortunately.
Yeah, an example of um, media embracing architecture in, in many respects, I think. Um, I'm going to show you another short clip um, of another Realities United project called Spots, um, which is a light and media installation on uh, Potsdamer Platz, um, one of the most recent um, architect-designed communicative membranes. Um, it, uh, yeah, 2005 is not that long ago, but you may look at it critically and discern elements that somehow feel somewhat um, little bit kind of anachronistic even in three years. I don't know. It, it, it had a life of 18 months and it was aimed at obviously generating an artistic, a more, an artistically loaded perception of the building complex. So here's the little clip. Um, human Screen um, prefigured the involvement with um, interactive screens by Nike, Virgin Atlantic and the likes. Um, it was a proposal that didn't get realized due to budgetary um, issues in 2004 by the Italian architects Stefano Mirti and Crispin Jones of Robson and Jones, who, who's, uh, they've made interactive work, educational works at the Science Museum in London. Um, this is an interactive screen concept for a public space developed at, for the, um, at the Inter Interactive Institute in Ivrea in Italy for the Salon de Mobile in Milan. As a visitor attraction, it aimed to create, uh, to, to capture images of visitors using cameras and displayed um, prepared images uh, simply to receive SMSs by, from visitors who could themselves play with the displays or simply doodle. Now, it's not surprising that commercial enterprises are using interactive techniques to build aura. 
to their brands. The Dutch practice uh, UN studio take their cue from fashionable se seasonal changes um, with a custom designed light reactive and programmable facade for the Galeria Hall West shopping mall. 4,330 um, sandblasted glass discs with an iridescent diachroic foil combined with a custom designed LED lighting system by Rogier van der Heide of Arab Lighting react to weather conditions by day and operate to full effect at, at night. Now, um, Galeria Hall West, I should say, is in Seoul in, in South Korea. Um, each of the discs acts like a big pixel on a giant screen, and it can also interface with film and video, making its hybrid identity on this scale, scale quite unprecedented. Ben van Berkel um, said to me, I wanted to create proliferating qualities to make it in interactive and dynamic. We like to test the malleability of surface colors as if we were de Chirico or Jeff Koons and achieve both phenomenological and literal transparency. Now a more intimate, here we have the different colorways of course. More intimate use of sensor systems um, in a commercial context. Um, Light Sounds was created for a shopping mall in Islington. It was a work by architectural practice D Squared with sound art artist Rolf Gelhaar, and it was set in a quiet zone of the center. Its ultrasound sensor systems enable it to detect the presence of passers-by, which accordingly triggers uh, light and sound sequences depending on their numbers and behavior. The pace of the colored changing, the changing colored light and the tone and the frequency of the sounds are slow. So the sensation of passing the work is like moving past a, a highly abstracted um, electronic garden. Another practice in Europe, Electronics Shadow, is a studio based in Paris, in two, in, uh, established in Paris in 2000 by Naziha Mestahui, who is a Brussels-born architect, and her partner, Yassine uh, Ait Kassi, a multimedia designer from Paris. It's an example of a new creative uh, working model. And they split their time between artistic experimentation and commercial commissions. So, for instance, the, these showrooms um, for Boffi, um, which are called H2O, um, Boffi being the Italian furniture ma manufacturer, and other interactive spatial concepts, um, which have, be you know, for upmarket brands like Giorgio Armani and Cassina, have become increasingly receptive. The animated elements of H2O are a five meter long pool of water, a series of walls and furniture that multiply your perception of space. Narrative elements appear, the silhouettes of um, a man and a woman, and then new backdrops, a bathroom, swimming pool, and terrace by the sea. With this digital interface, the space becomes as easy for the clients to change as an image. And, um, the, uh, the interface itself is more immersive, creates a more immersive environmental effect. Now, relatively few public buildings are programmed to respond to weather or movements of people, but the new Alliance football stadium in Munich, designed by um, Herzogin de Meuron and completed in 2005, it doesn't play with its spectators in quite that fashion but instead its lighting system um, of the facade creates a powerful aura supporting a sense of community ownership, you could say. Um, the facade is uh, ETFE, which is a self-cleaning Teflon coated fabric. It controls solar gain and it forms a membrane with rhomboid shaped inflated panels. Um, which is not only the largest of its kind in the world, but it, change color, it changes color from red to, to white to blue to reflect which one of the home teams, FC Bayern Munich or uh, TSV 
1860 München is using the ground at that particular time. Now, um, back here in, in California, in Los Angeles, many of you will be familiar with Electroland, two LA-based um, Harvard architecture graduates who create multidisciplinary in urban projects. Um, this is uh, Metlofts on Flower Street, and here the interactive carpet com combines environmental intelligence and human surveillance. How it works is it embeds a luminous field of um, LED lights into the lobby of this office building that respond to the presence of visitors. A massive display of lights on the building's facade mirror the patterns set up in the lobby, which participants witness on a video display in front of them. What drives um, the two uh, partners of Electroland is, is um, for them, is making manifest the vast invisible web of electronic activity, exploring fun ways to make it visible, and looking at how this um, pervasiveness and our now contemporary ability to program space um, to operate a designed ephemerality can change people's relationships to buildings and spaces. Now, much of the interesting uh, work in this field exploring the pervasiveness of electronic activity through surfaces um, and uh, um, the relationship between the physical and the immaterial um, has focused on particular um, techniques. Um, but not so many people actually would, let's say, forge a, uh, a bridge between the two by processes such as linking mobile phones and electromagnetic waves. Now, Usman Hack, um, as I mentioned before, uh, Sky Ear, um, a work that he did, he is an architect graduate of the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Um, it was presented at the Greenwich Maritime Museum in 2004 and in Switzerland. And it's um, a non-rigid cloud made up of um, hundreds of uh, beautifully glowing helium balloons from which are suspended mobile phones, LEDs, and electromagnetic sensors. Now, he is fascinated by um, how mobile phones condition our use of space now that they've become um, pretty much ubiquitous, well, certainly in industrialized society anyway. Um, the sensors detect, detect electromagnetic radiation in the, in the atmosphere, um, which in turn triggers the LEDs. So it's like a, a floating jellyfish sampling the spectrum that it creates. Sp spectators on the ground use their phones to call into the cloud and um, to hear the electromagnetic sounds. And their calls alter, uh, in turn, the topography inside it which alters its glow and color intensity. Um, now, Jason Bruges, um, a British architect who made the Wind to Light project, I showed you a clip of earlier. Um, here we have his memory wall. Um, he uh, founded his studio in London in 2001 after having senior positions at Norman Foster's office and at Imagination, and then before that training at the Bartlett, uh, like Usman. Now, while Usman works more as an artist, creating project teams in different countries around the world, from Singapore to Japan, the UK and Switzerland, to build his projects, um, Bruges is notable because with his team of 12 architects and software designers, he is one of genuinely few architects in the UK to pioneer a full-time practice in the creation of surfaces, spaces, and installations that occupy this territory between architecture, installation, art, and interactive design. Now, he is known, he's known for adapting innovative technologies from the entertainment, in, entertainment industry, um, cu coupled with materials and fabrication techniques from across the construction industry. Um, and this formula has been very fortunate 
uh, lucky and brought clients from across the museum health and education industries in the UK, Ireland, uh, Russia, China, and in Italy, where he's um, completing a cinema with a digital facade outside Milan for Norman Foster. There seems to be a very good synergistic relationship between um, Foster and, and Bruges. And his work ranges from the micro level of small installations through every aspect of buildings to strategic master plans for cities. Now, I mean, all his work centers on making prototypes that are tested out before launching. Um, for instance, an interactive garden of CFL um, uh, lamps. These are the com compact fluorescent lamps, green energy saving light bulbs for uh, Greenpeace at the 100% Design London event last September. Um, now, Memory Wall is a, a, mem a memonic, it's a kind of tricky word to say, memonic light matrix on the eighth floor lobby of the Puerto America Hotel in Madrid. Now, this is a building adapted by various architects who got individual floors to play with, and it responds to movements through the lobby space. Move, motions of individuals act as a catalyst for an ambient light projection and in which motion and form are captured, filtered, and projected onto the wall surfaces in a continuous loop with memories of the day building up on them. Here's a little clip. And that very tall woman is his uh, sister, actually, who's his MD. So she runs the show. Um, Bruges, he worked with Catherine Findlay, the Scottish architect for this project, and her architecture created the organic walls. His um, faceted LED matrix curtain of glass reinforced gypsum and fiber optics is laid flush with those surfaces um, as if it is pigmented, storing layers of activities and memories. So through a series of hidden cameras, um, that act as sensors and capture activity in the lobbies. The matrixes of light act as interpretations of the live, live camera feed. And the way the wall, walls mimic activity in the lobby, lobby is, um, is quite bio, biomimetic. Now, another of Jason's projects um, that underlines um, that data-driven interactive projects need not be, be dry but create quite a uh, an alluring subliminal impact in, in environments, even those used by car drivers, of course, is Litmus, which is, uh, which is a series of five 12 meter high interactive totem light structures that he um, sited on different um, roundabouts along the A13 route road outside, out of East London. Um, in Rain and Marshes in Essex, which is a, a rather a gla a gloomy post-industrial landscape and place of transition between the city and the country. Now, it was commissioned by the local council and installed three years ago. Each of the litmuses um, is a tower of translucent acrylic panels on a steel substructure with clusters of um, colored LED lights. And the way that it works is um, they, act of li they act as litmus papers, gathering, sensing, and responding to the, their immediate environment, um, taking in information and displaying it in a digitized form to passing traffic. So each tower is a different color geared to respond to different data. So you have yellow for changing light levels, orange to the tide level at Tilbury, raw blue for the amount of electricity uh, generated by neighborhood um, uh, wind turbines, and green for the amount of traffic coming into the area. So visually, the works are quite abstract viewed from a car, but they are forever changing, a bit like the variable message display system used on motorways. Now, here we come to the penultimate, yeah, penultimate um, practitioner that I'm going to talk about. Um, Dan Rosgaard is a Dutch, uh, Dutch architect. Um, he's uh, um, one of the youngest that I've discovered so far who's working full-time in the field, and he's trained as a sculptor, a sculptor in the Netherlands 
and then switched to architecture, for which he took a postgraduate degree at the Berlach Institute in Rotterdam. Now, exploring the digital, exploring the dynamic relationship between architecture, people, and new media, he makes the integration and infiltration of interactive media with architecture central to his work. So he recently prepared Flow 5.0, a new 12 meter long interactive sculpture for um, uh, a media festival in The Hague made out of hundreds of ventilators which react to human sounds and movements um, for an installation in the city hall in, in the city. He creates what are clearly artificial environments fed by natural elements. Um, I can show you what I mean um, with, with this work, which is called Dune 4.0, um, a recent interactive landscape. It was here shown in the, it's in the um, uh, Montevideo um, uh, Monte building in Rotterdam the New Media Institute in Amsterdam, and then most recently in the Mast Tunnel in Rotterdam. Here, is, here it is in the Mast Tunnel. It reacts to the sounds and motions of visitors as they work, walk through these corridor spaces. So you have large clusters of fibers on either side of um, the, the tunnel brighten up according to the sounds and motion of passing visitors. Inside the fibers, several microphones and presence sensors detect people's activities. The, the landscape dune, it has several moods. It's like a kind of um, domestic animal. If you make a lot of noise as you walk, then it gets very lively. Um, although in its makeup it is very, it's high tech, it is actually about deploying technology as an, a necessary yet invisible tool something that is a commonplace today, but before the intention of a sensual experience. It's also about enabling the visitor to personalize space in real time, all the, all, almost as an extension of your skin. You make the landscape, but the landscape also makes you. So um, as he says, um, Rosengard himself, through this process of watching and interacting, the visitor becomes conscious of himself or herself as a body and a dynamic relation with space and technology. And he is happy to work in the everyday environments like, like tunnels um, to move away from the sublime and the pressure of being uh, quote unquote too beautiful in public spaces. He likes making movies that never finish and with an air of intrigue um, akin to a Hitchcock movie. Okay, last project. One of the most successful interactive installations in London in the last year was um, Volume by UVA, which has now been shortlisted as Design of the Year by the Design Museum in the last um, 48 hours. And uh, who knows, it might even become the winner. Um, it's got a lot of other contenders. It, it's in, installed in the Italianate courtyard of the Victorian Albert Museum over many months uh, last winter. It's a building dating from um, 1909. 
Um, 46 2.5 meter high columns uh, form a grid of uh, LED lights rigged up to an audio system, computer and synthesizer network for each, each column. Each emitted um, different sounds by the band Massive Attack and modulated color that changed its mood in relation to, in response to people's movements. You had a digital camera with its own image processing uh, computer, which was placed high up in the courtyard, and it analyzes its installations, um, uh, the installation, figuring out where the people are. Of course, they're never in one place. Uh, they're always moving. Um, walking up to a column increases the volume of the sound. Walking away decreases it. If you stop walk moving for long enough, you became invisible and the column itself deactivated until you moved again. Now this simple system of rules generates complex emergent patterns um, as the number of people present increases. And the arrangement that you hear, um, the music, depends on your own path through the installation as well as on the movements of people around you. So physical reactions um, on, uh, in, that, uh, in the installation, or to the re installation, uh, range from the reserved to the exuberant, um, really quite um, amused reactions. People making efforts to see what created a response by a little bit of kind of impromptu scientific testing and also people negotiating each other's spaces the whole time. I mean, we've got a whole barrage of digital cameras set up here, of course, uh, everyone clicking away. Very cozy. Um, it, it's a prime example of how well digital media has encroached on the otherwise reserved and uh, quite staid physical world of museums, in some senses staid. Uh, technology is enabling visitors to have individualized and more intimate experiences of museums through the media of uh, audio um, and uh, PDA guides, MP3 players, podcasts to the use of RFID tags, all to personalize their journey through the museum. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, was incredibly successful. Okay, so just a little, a uh, few highlights about my, my books before I finish. Um, my first publication in the field 4D space, um, 2005, uh, set the scene. Then responsive environments for the V&A, uh, there it is, um, followed in 2006. Um, and commissioned by the V&A deliberately to, to try to capture this, this emerging field that they themselves were commissioning increasing numbers of artists and designers to do projects for. Um, so it was almost like um, uh, overdue for documentation. And the cover has Rafael Lozana Hemas, uh, the Mexican video artist Rafael, who um, uh, made body movers, um, projection-based work in many iterations, but famously first uh, rather early in the process, staged in Rotterdam in the Schoburg Plein uh, Square in 2002 on the cover. It's very playful, but it also, um, like all his works, generates reflection on the idea of embodiment disembodiment, and exactly what spectacular representation in city context might be. Um, my most recent book, 4D Social, which we launched with a conference at Tate Modern in September, uh, looks at the whole spectrum of um, uh, of the theme of social networks and interactive projects. So looking at social interactivity fostered by these works um, with, as I say, museums and galleries leading the way in commissioning interactive projects. Um, clearly there's been a, a, a full-scale junking of the simplistic black box or the kiosk model of physical um, uh, installation of spaces in museum and are striving for more resonant projects with more poetic interfaces that subtly colonize um, gallery, uh, museums, gallery spaces.
So um, just one, one observation before I finish is that um, about cultural practices in this field that I make, I make it now and I made, make it in so, 4D social, which um, if you haven't read, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to um, encourage you to, to buy it. <laughs> simple plug here. Um, it, it's about the simple repurposing of technologies, customizing what exists in order to achieve the right results. Interactive practitioners like Hack, Bruges, and Electroland, they are very comfortable with the idea of hacking um, existing technologies to make customized interfaces, sensors, biofeedback devices, and actuators. I mean, uh, Hack, for instance, uh, interesting name, actually designed a kit of parts a few years ago, which I feature in Responsive Environments, senses, sensors and actuators, which he made from simply very cheap hack toys, um, like cheap children's walkie-talkies or desk fans for a project um, that he did with the Hungarian interactive architect, um, or architectural du duo, a Aether architecture, um, and s subsequently will use that kit of parts in different ways for other projects. Um, at the same time, for a project at the V&A, Bruges um, hacked a portable PlayStation console, which was provided by Sony as sponsorship, and thereby creating bespoke video content that visitors to a Friday evening event could customize um, in application themselves personally to what he calls an image cloud, which was an interactive chandelier. Um, quite an effect, I must say. So I talked about the supernatural aspect earlier on, and in a way, supernatural came in um, to my research quite jokingly um, when Dan Rosegard said to me one day that he saw his work as being a little bit analogous to Alice in Wonderland type of alternative narratives about space and, uh, and functionality and behavior. Now, customized design interventions, whether by architects, media artists, or designers, um, creatively appropriates technologies. Um, they draw at the same time on biological and natural data and address a wider and more individualized set of functions, desires, and experiences. I do really hope that soft space as an emerging hybrid discipline will con continue to embrace the ability, of, uh, the ability that we have to program space as an activity shared by creator and participant. Thereby, in the process, the participant becomes a co-curator, co-creator <laughs> co and curator of meaning. Um, hand in hand with this scope for mutability, ephemerality, and freshly constructed narratives is an enabling of new relationships between building and program, urban spaces and their occup occupants, um, new non-generic relationships. Um, to evolve, ultimately, a more personal and reflective character. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope that you will consider having a look at my books and uh, that you'll be motivated to pursue this whole uh, field of activity further, because I do honestly think it has massive potential. Whether that's commercial potential is probably another issue, but certainly cultural potential is no doubt about it. Thank you. So, thank you, Lucy. I think we got an extremely useful, interesting, and up-to-date sort of like a survey of this this field that I personally find equally sort of like important, interesting as you. So, and um, and I'm of course I was also pleased to. Pleased to see that there were some links with the things that some people affiliated with this department are doing, like mm -hmm. you showed, where by Christian Muller and also Mark Hansen, who is present here. So Mark Hansen's piece, The Listening Post, was on the cover of one of your books. Mm -hmm. Plus, I could add that the uh, founder of Electroland, so Cameron McNall, has been teaching in this department for many years. So there are all these links and, links and connections that uh, 
connect this field, your research, and our, our mm. department. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think it is a good thing. So I would uh, suggest that, um, that we, we could actually um, continue kind of a chat informally by the sandwiches. Sure. Unfortunately, for the remote participant, I cannot extend this in, in sort of like uh, uh, invitation. But anyway, I, I thank everybody for attending this thing. And I, I hope that this is an opening for something, not the sort of like a conclusion of, of this uh, important topic. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>